one step past. Hollywood Light Sides. Actors of the Golden Age. No Dirt. This is a celebration of 20 actors from Hollywood's Golden Age. Whether they were big shots, little shots, or average shots, all of these guys had a fun side. Clark Gable. Everyone knows about, or should know about, Clark Gable, at least by name. He had an incredibly successful acting career. Perhaps his most famous role is that of Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind. It took Clark Gable quite a bit to break into show business, and he worked a lot of different jobs before he got famous. He was once a lumberjack in the heavy timber country of Oregon. The woman in Clark Gable's life, whom everyone knows best, is Carol Lombard. They had actually first met while working on a movie in 1932, but she was still married to William Powell, and the two didn't get to know each other very well. It wasn't until 1936 when they became reacquainted at a party. It was a costume party, and Carol arrived in a big white ambulance. She was riding in the back of it on a white stretcher covered in a sheet. This is the icebreaker to end all icebreakers. Clark had a rough and tumble personality. Carol had a warped sense of humor. The two just clicked. Carol Lombard later gave Clark Gable that same ambulance and he drove around in it for two years. They married in 1939, but the union ended when Carol died in a plane crash in January of 1942. Clark Gable also had a talent for skeet shooting. Burgess Meredith Another actor who liked to play with ambulances was Burgess Meredith. In order to get from the radio broadcasting studio to the theater in time for his play, Burgess would hire a loud sirened ambulance to get there fast. During the Golden Age, Burgess Meredith was quite an accomplished actor of radio, stage, and screen. He was highly praised by critics as well as directors and other people in the industry. And he always had a lot of work. One thing always seemed to elude him in those days. Wide-scale popularity with the public at large. He wasn't a pretty boy like Cary Grant. He wasn't a comedian like Jack Benny. He just acted. The really great fame of Burgess Meredith came after the Golden Age. In 1966, he was cast as the Penguin in the Batman TV series. In 1976, he started playing boxing trainer Mickey Goldmill in the Rocky films. Very late in his career, he appeared as the humorous father of Jack Lemmon in both Grumpy Old Men films from 1993 and 1995. These are the roles that his fans remember best, and they're all entirely different from each other. He really did have range. Edmund Lowe This may not be a name you're familiar with today, but in the early golden age of Hollywood, Edmund Lowe was a major star. He worked in vaudeville before becoming a major name in silent films. Edmund made a smooth transition to sound pictures, unlike a lot of silent film stars. Then, something weird happened. By the mid-1930s, he had gone from leading man to supporting actor. Why? Who knows? Edmund got bigger parts in B-movies where his name power and acting ability brought prestige to low-budget pictures. He was still a star, just not the matinee idol he once was. One of his later projects is actually quite good. Edmund Lowe was the star of the TV series Front Page Detective. It ran from 1951 to 1953 on the Dumont Network. In it, he played newspaper columnist David Chase and he helped police solve baffling mysteries. Edmund also had a terrier by the name of Cocktail. When Cocktail got older, he lost his eyesight. Edmund actually bought a trained police dog to become Cocktail's seeing eye dog. Ah, to be a privileged Hollywood dog. Matt Moore. Another actor with a spoiled dog was Matt Moore. This spoiled pooch lived the good life. 
Matt set up a charge account at a Hollywood hamburger stand so his dog could get a bite when she passed by. Matt Moore is a name you may not be familiar with. It's a shame because he appeared in well over 200 movies from 1912 to 1958. He was born in Ireland and came to Hollywood for his acting career. He was a major player during the silent era. As time went on, he was reduced to supporting roles, but he still worked heavily and still had name recognition in the industry. It's strange, then, that we really don't know much about Matt Moore's personal life. He lived until the age of 72, but his cause of death still hasn't been publicly disclosed. Despite his relative obscurity, he has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Matt had two cats that he really loved and they often appeared in his movies. They both have stars in the animal section of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Tyrone Power Tyrone Power had an impressive film career, but he may be best known as the most famous Zorro of all time in The Mark of Zorro from 1940. Tyrone used to work at a local radio station and, on his program, he read Sunday comics from the newspaper to his kitty listeners. Lee Tracy Not to be confused with Spencer Tracy. Lee Tracy isn't a huge star in the way of Clark Gable and Cary Grant, but he worked a lot and had a long acting career. He played a lot of fast-talking, irate little guys like reporters, press agents, lawyers, and salesmen. Lee was typecast for sure, but typecast actors become the best known to audiences in the long run. If you watch a lot of movies and television shows from the Golden Age, you should be very familiar with Lee Tracy or his often copied personality type. Lee Tracy did have a different kind of leading role that deserves mention. He was one of four actors to play Martin Kane, Private Eye. It started as a radio show in 1949 and, just a month later, debuted on TV. It was the first TV detective series, and it ran through 1954 on NBC. Lee was the last actor to play Martin Kane on radio for the second half of 1952. On TV, he was the third Martin Kane from 1952 to 1953. Martin Kane was your typical private detective character and it shows that Lee had some range. In his youth, Lee Tracy was a troublemaker. He was expelled from high school after he hit the principal over the head with a chair. I think today's professional wrestlers must have taken some inspiration from him. It's the Lee Tracy Smackdown! Feel the bird! Orson Welles Orson Welles is distinguished beyond belief. He worked in stage, screen, radio, and wasn't above making TV appearances. He was an actor, director, producer, and screenwriter. His radio broadcast of The War of the Worlds in 1938 really propelled him to fame. His first movie, Citizen Kane, was released in 1941 and is often cited as the greatest film ever made. What a lot of people forget about Orson Welles is that he was a lifelong master magician. He was really, really good at it, and his magic act is worth watching. When some people get stressed, they like to drink. What was Orson Welles' drink of choice? Hot orange juice. I don't know why you would want orange juice warmed up, but that was his thing. In my video about actresses from the Golden Age, there was one who liked to wash her face with orange juice. Watch that video to find out who I'm talking about. And now, on to the actor Orson Welles thought was the greatest, James Cagney. Often heralded as the toughest of tough guys in the Golden Age, James Cagney carved out a great career for himself playing intense heroes and villains. He actually did have a range and could do comedy and other things, but he got typecast as a tough guy. So what does a tough guy do when he's not being a tough guy? He takes ballet lessons. 
That is exactly what James Cagney did in the late 1930s. He was actually a great dancer, and ballet became one of his many skills. Ray Milland Ray Milland was a major Hollywood leading man in the Golden Age. He was born in Wales. Before acting fame, he was a member of the Household Cavalry. This is what they called the elite force of 400 men, assigned as the King of England's Royal Guard. Ray was also an expert shot with a pistol and rifle. He even won championships. Boris Karloff The most famous horror movie actor of all time. He became the iconic image of Frankenstein and the mummy. His real name was William Henry Pratt, and he came from England. He adopted the Russian stage name of Boris Karloff. Boris worked very, very heavily. He could never break loose of the horror genre, but he did widen his scope in later years and got more into comedy horror films. There was a reason he couldn't shake horror movies. He was very, very good at playing creepy bad guys. In real life, he couldn't have been less like the characters he often played. He liked growing prize flowers in his spare time. On a personal note, I've talked with a lot of people who worked with Boris Karloff in his later films, and everyone told me the same thing. Boris Karloff was a nice, funny guy, and a gentleman. Boris Karloff's early days were not filled with great success. He moved to Canada and tried to make it in show business either there or in Hollywood. Boris worked on stage and in early silent films. His work was sporadic at best. Boris was forced to do hard, manual labor for years. It was literally back-breaking work, and Boris suffered from back problems for the rest of his life. It was this ailment that kept him out of World War I. Boris was just about to quit acting altogether and return to Canada when he gave Lon Chaney Sr. a ride into Hollywood from another studio. The first Lon Chaney ultimately became a name actor and is best known for being the Phantom of the Opera. Along the way, Chaney told Boris about his own early struggles before he found success. This gave Boris Karloff the inspiration he needed to keep acting and, ultimately, become very huge. What's ironic about this is that Boris Karloff and Lon Chaney Jr., the famous Wolfman of the movies, weren't friends. Lon Chaney Jr. was a good actor with a lot of range. He became better known than his famous father. However, he was jealous of Boris Karloff's success and didn't do much to hide it. They got along well enough to work together in some films, but Chaney was always envious of Karloff's star power and the fact that he got more work. Chaney's drinking also held him back. Neither actor had anything to be jealous of the other about. Both enjoyed very good and long careers. Lon Chaney Sr. Since I brought up Lon Chaney Sr., I'm not about to continue without telling you about his ghost. Yes, the legend of Lon Chaney Sr.'s ghost was quite famous in the early 20th century. He died in 1930 at the too soon age of 47. Lon was really well liked, so it hit everyone in Hollywood pretty hard. Remember that pep talk Lon gave to Boris Karloff when the young actor was about to give up his career? Well, that wasn't a one-off incident. Immediately after his death, the ghost of Lon Chaney Sr. started appearing. There was a public bench at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. When Lon was just a struggling extra boy, he would sit on that bench and wait for the bus. After Lon became a star, he would drive by that bench and give a lift to anyone who was a struggling extra like he had been. After Lon died, he would be seen sitting on that ornamental iron bench. Allegedly, various young actors would sit on that bench next to him, not realizing he was a ghost. They would get to talking, and Lon would give the actor words of wisdom, just like he had done for Boris Karloff years earlier. At some point, 
the ghost was seen by enough people to be sufficiently recognized as Lon Chaney Sr. The bench became famous and, ultimately, people didn't want to sit on it anymore. At least the people who knew about the ghost didn't want to sit there. In October of 1942, the bench simply vanished. So did Lon's ghost. What happened to the bench? Did Lon's ghost go away, or did he just relocate? A bench with an advertisement was put in its place, and that's how it stayed. Did Lon Chaney Jr. believe in the friendly ghost of his father? That isn't known to us, but he didn't seem to be offended by the notion. He once appeared in a photo with the famous bench. If the street corner is no longer haunted by Lon's ghost, then Universal Studios just might have been. It was on Soundstage 28 where the popular Phantom of the Opera was filmed in 1925. According to many people, including security guards, that location was very haunted. Some people claim to have seen the ghost up close and have positively identified him as Lon Chaney Sr. Soundstage 28 was entirely demolished in late 2014. On the stage, Lon was seen wearing a cape. When he wasn't seen on the stage, whispered voices would sometimes be heard. Lon was also seen running around in the catwalks. Even more odd, he was sometimes seen carrying a chandelier. Lights would go on and off without explanation. Doors would open and close just as inexplicably. See Aubrey Smith. Charles Aubrey Smith had a very long career in stage and film. He was always a big name, but usually a supporting actor. As a British actor, he played distinguished old gentleman types. Before he was an actor, he was a professional cricket player, called a cricketer. He was so good at it that years later, when in Hollywood, he organized cricket games with other British actors. This was a spectacle for the locals because cricket still isn't a well-known game in America. He also enjoyed collecting smoking pipes. His pipe collection came from countries all over the world. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Gary Cooper. Before Gary Cooper became a Hollywood screen legend, he was a cartoonist for the Helena Daily Independent newspaper in Helena, Montana. He drew editorial cartoons. Fred Astaire. In the Hollywood Golden Age, there were many famous dancing men. Fred Astaire is, perhaps, the most famous of them all. By himself, or with Ginger Rogers, Fred was a major star. Fred's hair was always sparse when he was making movies. He had to wear a toupee for film roles. In public, however, Fred Astaire would go out without either a wig or a hat. Apparently, movie executives had more of a problem with Fred's hair loss than he did. Humphrey Bogart Humphrey Bogart is one of the biggest, most recognizable names to come from Hollywood's Golden Age. People remember his name, the way he looked, and the way he talked. Whether he played a hero or a villain, Humphrey Bogart always had that tough guy persona. And he loved smoking. Many years ago, his last name became a verb for smoking. That's the power of pop culture. Humphrey collected cigar store Indians. He would get them from any store that no longer wanted them. Today, this collection would be worth a fortune. William Powell William Powell was a very good actor. He did good stuff. He had so many hugely successful films that it's hard to pin him down, but he's probably best known for the Thin Man films and My Man Godfrey. Comedian Don Adams did an impression of William Powell in his nightclub act and TV appearances. He used the same voice for the cartoon character Tennessee Tuxedo in 1963, the funny spy Maxwell Smart in TV's Get Smart in 1965, 
and the Inspector Gadget cartoon character in 1983. A lot of people who know about all three of these characters may not realize they were supposed to be William Powell. William didn't start out playing leading men. As a matter of fact, he played everything but a leading man type for years before he became a star. He played serious villains, comedic heels, and straight up buffoons. William did a lot of slapstick in his early days. Although a lot of his famous roles showed a strong sense of humor, you wouldn't suspect he was once into wacky comedy. Robert Young Robert Young seems to have had three parts to his career. The Father Knows Best sitcom, the Marcus Welby MD doctor drama, and everything else. Long before his famous radio and TV shows, Robert Young was an established leading man in many, many films. Robert's popularity was unique. He was locked into B-movies, but he had A-list popularity. His movies also featured many popular A-list actresses as his leading ladies. When Father Knows Best came along on radio in 1949, it was almost as if he rebooted his career. A lot of people familiar with the Father Knows Best TV show may believe that's where he started. It's certainly true that his star status continued to rise. The older he got, the more famous he became. This can't be said for most actors. Robert Young is an instantly likable screen persona. There is no hating this guy. He doesn't do anything annoying. Robert liked jigsaw puzzles. He once had a gigantic jigsaw puzzle that took the entire floor of his drawing room to be laid out. That's showing some puzzle love. Gregory Peck Gregory Peck was one of Hollywood's biggest stars from the 1940s to 1970s. He was in too much to mention, and simply putting him in a movie would almost always guarantee its success. Gregory's early days, however, were pretty humble. He worked at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Gregory didn't perform there, however. He worked as a uniformed tour guide. Charles Butterworth He was sometimes called Charlie Butterworth. The name might not be familiar to you. You may not even be familiar with his face. His voice, however, should be very familiar to you. When the Cap'n Crunch serial character was in development, voice actor Dawes Butler based his voice on that of Charles Butterworth. Since the commercial started in the 1960s, everyone who knows Cap'n Crunch is familiar with that distinctive voice. The voice of Cap'n Crunch has been heavily imitated over the years. Many people who have copied the character's voice probably don't have any idea who Charlie Butterworth was. Butterworth was well known for his comedy roles, especially in musicals. He is actually the first person to say the line, Why don't you slip out of those wet clothes and into a dry martini? A lot of people think this was a Groucho Marx invention, but it was actually Charles Butterworth in the 1937 film, Every Day's a Holiday. He also invented other things besides funny lines. Charlie hated cold slippers, so much so that he invented an electrically heated rug for his bedside. The rug kept his slippers nice and toasty as he slept. I don't believe Charlie ever had any intention of quitting show business. He was well liked and received a lot of work, along with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Unfortunately, a fatal car accident took him from us in 1946 at the too young age of 49. If he ever wanted to quit acting, however, he could have easily gotten a job at any newspaper in the country. Before he got into acting, Charles was a well-known newspaper writer in Chicago and New York City. He also could have fallen back on his law degree. And last, but not least, guess who? This guy did something so cool then I'm not even going to tell you his real name until the end, so pay attention. Once upon a time, in 1930, there was an obscure actor who we will call, for now, Mystery Man. 
For all his talent, he had almost no money and couldn't catch even a small break. Mystery Man had tried desperately to get into stage acting, any kind of acting. He couldn't get work. He couldn't even talk to anybody. The only thing he was told is that he was a no-name actor and they didn't want him. Come back when you're famous, is what they would say. He even had good looks. It was ridiculous. When a man gets desperate, he gets creative. Mystery Man got an idea to make himself famous. English actors and accents were in high demand. He also knew that three-fourths of all Broadway plays at the time came from England. Mystery Man didn't have much money. He had to get additional funds from his friends. With this money, Mystery Man was going to take a trip to England. Mystery Man arrived in England and spent some time learning how to be English, even mastering the accent. He then went to a local theater in a town called Harrogate. Mystery Man had even bought himself a fancy new English wardrobe for the occasion. On the spot, Mystery Man invented a fake name for himself, something that sounded really English and sexy. Mystery Man will now be known, until further notice, as Blade Stanhope Conway. Blade talked to a janitor outside the theater and offered him a bribe. Blade wanted the man to put his name up in lights above the theater. It would give the illusion that Blade Stanhope Conway was a huge star in England. There would also be posters and signs outside the theater making like Blade had a big show happening inside. In reality, there was nothing going on for Blade in the theater. It would, however, look very good in a photograph, especially when Blade posed in the photo wearing his fancy new outfit. After the photo session, Blade was on his way. He quickly sent off copies of the photo to 80 different theatrical agents and producers. Blade had to borrow some more money to get back to America. Back in New York City, he was able to get several meetings with people who had received his photo. Just like that. They were satisfied that Blade Stanhope Conway had a British acting background. They knew nothing of what Blade could do. The only way Blade was able to get that far was by deception. It's quite an extreme way to falsify your resume, but it worked. He immediately got stage work, and it wasn't long before he started appearing in Hollywood films. Blade had talent, and it was a very quick progression. Laurel and Hardy gave Blade his first movie role in Sons of the Desert, the incredibly funny feature film from 1933. It was a small part as a ship steward, but it was something for which Blade was always grateful. Here it comes! Soon after, Blade Stanhope Conway became known to movie fans all over as leading man Robert Cummings, later shortened to Bob Cummings. Robert had an incredible career in films. He had range, but he generally played very serious parts in serious movies. It was a surprise to all his fans, and Hollywood in general, when he decided to become a television star. Even more, Bob wanted to focus on comedy. As it turned out, he was extremely good at it. Bob's first series, My Hero, was not a great success. However, he became a TV giant with the Bob Cummings show that aired from 1954 to 1959, also known as Love That Bob. That's all for now. All of these guys made Hollywood a fun place. Their personalities are what made them stars. Their screen personas evolved from the kind of fun-loving people they were in real life. Every one of these actors was truly unique. Maybe that's why actors of the Golden Age are still deemed the greatest of all time. One thing is for certain. Their movies and television shows are still fun to watch. Until next time, keep it light.